I got a degree in computer science before the internet, and now I can't write a regular expression without asking ChatGPT to help me out. Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. I'm Dave Plummer, a retired operating systems engineer from Microsoft, going back to the MS-DOS and Windows 95 days. And as fans of the channel already know, I worked on things like Task Manager and Pinball, Zip Folders, the Start Menu, Desktop, Activation, and a lot more. Recently, Microsoft invited me back to do an Ask Me Anything session, and so I spent some time with them on Zoom answering questions. Now, unfortunately, AV issues with the recording made a lot of it unusable, particularly their end of things where you couldn't really hear the question I was being asked to answer. And so I went through and I recreated the questions and added some text captions so you'd know what it was that I was talking about. And so, to the best of my ability, here are my answers. When choosing projects, did you decide based on impact or other features? In my early years, I wasn't overly worried about advancement. I mean, I started at 35k a year, so I figured if I was going to make any real money, it would be on the stock options. So I guess I was paradoxically in it for the greater good of the company based entirely on my own selfish reasons. Um, the stock situation also led to some weird things where it could be the person next to you who might not in fact be any smarter than you, but by virtue of having started just before the IPO, now has $50 million. And once you're kind of cool with that reality, it takes a lot of the pressure off, I think. I was driven, really, by working on projects that I thought would be on everybody's desktop, as it were. I wanted to be at Microsoft to work on the operating systems that everybody was using, and once I got there, I tried very hard to work on the actual key products that I cared about, like MS-DOS and Windows. I guess a few projects, like Windows Pinball, I agreed to take on as extra work simply because they were cool or fun. I mean, when else do you get a chance to get paid to code on, and better yet, test a game like Pinball? I was also into user interface coding and love to write apps in Borland's Turbo C editor using their window and dialog framework, so, no, well, because I couldn't afford a copy of the Windows SDK at the time, actually. Coming to Microsoft and then being able to work on the actual UI was all the impact that I needed to have. Otherwise, I wasn't very eager to build an empire or anything like that. I mean, I didn't know that I had autism, but management came with its challenges anyway. I wanted to be in on the important meetings, but not because I wanted to be seen in the important meetings. I wanted to be there when the big decisions were being made. Beyond that, it didn't really matter much. Later on, I realized that at least in those days, a lot of the big decisions were being made in the code editor, not in the meetings, so I was content with such power as I had. At the end of the day, it was always more about what I got to work on and who I got to work on it with. Picking a team where you can learn a lot from the stronger members of the team was always important too. What kinds of things should young people be learning today? Well, I've got one kid in computer science for now, but growing up, my kids weren't interested in coding, probably because they saw what I was doing for a living and just didn't have any appeal for them. It wasn't until my youngest daughter was 16, and it's fairly recent, that I thought to explain that learning programming doesn't mean doing what I do. You don't have to spend your days in a darkened garage hacking an assembly language amongst a whole bunch of RGB LEDs in order to be a real software developer. So don't let the way that I spend my spare time scare you off. Like when one of my kids was into Minecraft, he learned Python so he could hack and script the game. He did it as a means to an end. It wasn't about the coding for him. It was about getting Minecraft to do what he wanted. But I recommend kids learn Python because it's powerful enough to do almost anything, but easy enough to get started with. And there are a ton of great and free tutorials aimed at kids available on YouTube. How important is it for young engineers to understand the inner workings of a system? I think it depends on to what level you can treat the system as a trusted black box that just always works. You want to be able to debug into and understand at least one level deeper than where you're working, I think. For example, if you're a C programmer, you can likely take it as a given that printf will work and do the right thing when you call it. When you don't get the output you expect, the odds are the bug is in your code versus within the implementation of printf. You're not going to debug into the printf code a lot of times to check for bugs. You're going to focus on your own code. So in a case like that, it's still good to have an understanding how printf works, but you won't spend a lot of time debugging in its call stack. Now, if, however, you're dogfooding a new operating system like we were at the time, it turns out there's very little that you can trust implicitly, and being familiar with the whole stack from the kernel on through user and into your own code was highly valuable. Not every programmer needs to be able to operate at that level, but there are and will continue to be positions where somebody needs to be able to do it. Did you happen to use Microsoft Bob in any projects? I did. I guess uh, somebody probably knows the story already, but I guess it bears repeating. When I was working on product activation for XP, I had to find a way to tie different types of product keys like retail, OEM, and volume to the media that they were associated with. 
because I had to guard against the expected scenario where somebody would ultimately leak a volume key, and I didn't want that key to work with just regular retail media. But if retail and volume were only different by a few bytes, you could just patch the image and then use the stolen key. So I decided to make the SKUs different enough that you'd need a large delta that would make it prohibitively large to host on the internet, at least back at that time. And to do that, I would stuff about 10 megabytes of random non-compressible data on the CD in the spare space, and then check to make sure you had the right spare blob to match your key. Now, there are lots of ways to get a non-compressible random block of data, not the least of which is CryptGen RAN, which is probably the right way to do it. But since I didn't understand that API at a deep level and how it generated the data, I decided to commit the worst sin a developer can commit, which is to roll my own security and encryption solution. First, I needed data that was already fully compressed, and so I decided to start with the Microsoft Bob product images from our product server because they were about the right size and already compressed with Microsoft's diamond compression. I took those cab files, combined them, and then started encrypting them. I zipped the files, encrypted them in the archive, and then encrypted the archive with a couple layers of things like 1024-bit PGP encryption and a couple of others and so on. And I was generating random keys using mouse movements and didn't save them, so there's no chance that I can personally decrypt it. So, unless and until somebody breaks all the layers of encryption on the data, it will remain safely locked away on the XPCD forever. Kind of like the Weezer video on the Win95. How much planning and design went into features back then? Were there any ideas that were rushed through? I'd say that the features we knew about in advance were always well designed by talented designers. Like the Windows 95 UI might not be perfect, but it's incredibly well thought out for what it is, and it's also an entirely new paradigm at the time for productivity UI. We're still trying to use a start menu to get things done 30 years later, after all. But the edge cases where a developer runs into a feature that no one knew they needed could cause problems. We were under such a crush of new code for the most part that you just did what you felt was right and then moved on as fast as you could, as best you could, without going back to the well for a whole new design every time. A good example of that is the format dialog. Windows 95 was certainly capable of formatting a disk, but when it came time to implement that feature for NT, we wanted to expose multiple file systems and various other options like compression that NT supported and that were new. And when I say new, I mean they were new to the Windows 95 UI because Windows 95 didn't have compression or NTFS or encryption or any of those things. And so you get situations like you had one Thursday morning in about 1994, which is when I think I realized that the Win95 format UI wasn't going to work for us and that I'd have to come up with something new. I dutifully listed all of the options that the user could select from, like which file system and whether compression was enabled and cluster size and all that stuff. And I basically made a temporary dialog that listed all of these choices out as a long vertical stack. It was perfectly functional, but hardly a piece of elegance like much of the rest of the UI. I fully expected and assumed that some talented UI designer would come along and revise it with a real user interface before we shipped, but that never happened. And so now, when you go into the format dialog today, in 2024, you're still getting the same temporary dialog that I laid out in the Visual Studio Resource Editor that Thursday morning, about 30 years ago. I guess the lesson is that there are no temporary fixes, so don't check in code that you're not totally willing to live with for a long time. That reminds me of one more format-related anecdote that kind of ties into the question because it was one of those impromptu decisions that wasn't really designed in. The maximum size of a FAT32 volume, which I wound up setting at 32 gigabytes. You see, FAT can only have a certain number of clusters and sectors, and the bigger the volume, the bigger those clusters have to be. And long story short, the bigger the volume, the more wasted space you'd wind up with due to what's known as cluster slack. And to me, by the time you got to 32k per cluster wasted per every one byte file that you potentially had, that just seemed like the limits of how wasteful you'd ever want to be. And so it was an arbitrary choice, but that's now as much as the UI will support for removable media, even though the underlying FAT32 file system can, in theory, support up to 2 terabytes. And the reality is that once 8,000 consumer devices that use SD cards that have never seen anything more than 32 gigabyte exist in the wild, you likely don't want to suddenly introduce larger volumes because they'd be completely untested in most devices. When it came to the user interface, it was probably written by 100 developers and ported to NT by about 8 of us, and so it was just a lot of sheer code to work through. And when you hit an edge case because NT was different than Win95 in some way, you basically had to make a judgment call on the spot or with your friends or your co-workers consulting on how to handle it. I remember I was exposing NT's native file compression in the user interface, and one of the executive decisions I made that day was to go into the shell's default view and change the text label so that they were blue for compressed files and green for encrypted files. That way you could tell just by looking whether a file was compressed or encrypted, 
or at least you could if you were not yellow blue colorblind which in my defense is a lot rarer than red green colorblind but it's still a thing so the whole feature fails on a usability basis as long as at least if there's no other way to tell besides the color but all in all i'd say that the ui was designed pretty well but that some of the stuff we had to make up on the spot was a bit less so do you find yourself leveraging ai for your current coding i do I use it a lot, primarily as a debugger, a second set of eyes, and yeah, I'm really for debugging more than anything. I guess in some cases I'll get it to crank out the math functions or the skeletal version of some function that I plan to write, but there aren't a lot of cases yet, if any, where I'm taking its output as whole cloth new code. That's coming, but we're not really quite there yet. Perhaps the thing I use it more than anything for is to feed my own problematic code back into it and ask ChatGPT to scrutinize it. I've been restoring a full stack Kim 1 from 1975 with memory boards and I.O. boards and video boards and so on, and I had to write the basic graphics primitives for the display that it had. So I decided to write a clock, and that meant I needed the real basics, clear screen, set pixel, line draw, and circle at a minimum. So I wrote all of this in 6502 assembly and was testing it on the Kim 1 and everything worked, except my circles were coming out square like you were drawing them on an Etch-a-Sketch. And when initially neither me nor ChatGPT could figure out what was wrong with the code, I thought I'd try something new. I took a screenshot of what the Kim 1 was producing and uploaded that, along with the code in question, and then asked ChatGPT if it could see why the circles were square. And in fact, it caught a weird edge case where the vertical step increment was being reset to zero in every iteration of the loop instead of just once at the beginning, and it was kind of a fairly subtle bug. But the important thing is that it debugged it based on seeing the output, and that kind of blew my mind. Old code was a lot tighter. What do you think that's doing to software today? Well, as an old gray-bearded curmudgeon, you'd think I'd be moaning the state of kids today and the fat code they write, but I think in most cases it almost doesn't matter simply because hardware is just so fast these days. And I know that's a cop-out, and I'm not defending it as a philosophy, just as the reality. Because what matters is the user experience, and that's what's always driven me. Like with Task Manager, when you press Control shift escape when logon starts up the task manager for you. But if there's a running instance, the existing one just pops forward. But none of that logic is in when logon. All it knows how to do is start task manager at XE. And it's all built into task manager itself. So when you press that key sequence and a task manager is already running, what really happens is a whole second one is created, which interrogates the existing instance to make sure it's in good running order. And then it activates and surfaces the existing one and then goes away. Long story short, that means that just to bring Task Manager to the foreground requires launching an entire Task Manager process and running it from scratch. And that's the reason it had to be small and fast. I think the shipping NT4 version was 87k and I went to some extreme lengths to get down there. Like I only linked to GDI and user and I excluded the compiler runtimes and stuff like that. So that was one of the pitfalls of using a tool that the team had really outgrown. Shortly after that we moved to something called Source Depot and that's what we were using when I left. I imagine today everything is Git, as I think I said earlier. When did Microsoft figure out that security became an important feature? It wasn't really any one thing, but I think the blaster worm finally pushed awareness over the edge, and it was XPSP3 where we finally got the religion. The kernel had always been secure against, you know, user mode attacks, but the user code was generally less so. And of course, once you become administrator, the dist distinctions are far less, so if you can do escalation through a user mode exploit, you're kind of in. And so for SP3, we basically went through the whole code base with an eye to things like buffer overruns and safe string manipulation, those sorts of things. And people got educated on matters like SQL injection attacks and never trusting user input and all the basics. What were some cool ideas that you wanted to productize but never got the chance? Well, I'm fortunate that everything I worked on, save the Media Center prototype, shipped as a product. And even the media center as an idea eventually shipped, even if it wasn't with any of my code. But the one that got away, I think that would have to be auto PC. I mean, I love cars and I love computers, so it might have been ideal for me. And as far back as the late 90s, I was a big advocate of Microsoft developing a car operating system, but there just wasn't much appetite for it. Plus, I was just an angry coding monkey and had no real idea how to internally advocate for such a project anyway, at least not back then. Microsoft did wind up doing something with Ford, I think, called Sync, but I was of the opinion that it shouldn't be tied to any one OEM. Because I figured that people tended to upgrade their operating system every five years or so, but they lease a new car every three, so why not sell them a new operating system every three years as well? I also worked on a lot of side projects, like shareware stuff, and so I kind of got my creativity out that way. 
I had products like the zip file support that did get productized along the way simply because I was tinkering in my spare time. It's kind of a tangent. As an interviewer, I was always interested in what people were doing at home. Not every great developer writes code at home, but it seems a lot of them do. Or are they, you know, they're always trying new things and trying to master things they might not get a chance to use or work with at work. What pieces of tech would you like to take with you back to 1994? Well, the number one thing would be a local instance of ChatGPT, particularly one already trained on 2022 info. But maybe in terms of hardware, probably the number one thing I'd miss going back would be my 5K monitor I just got. So I'd like to take that with me, but driving it might be interesting. Any concerns about AI, like that we might be outsourcing too much of our creativity to machines? I figure if you're an artist who can't produce better work than a computer, then you're not adding a lot of value as an artist. And that's true in most every field. Everyone's going to have to adapt to some extent, and I think it's going to change coding a great deal. There might be a lot less grunt work, more creative work, more cross-team and executive function stuff. The daily job for a lot of developers will be less about the minutiae and more about assembling blocks to form some big picture. I think for the near to medium term, AI might produce the pieces which you then you assemble into some kind of workable solution for the user. But in terms of being able to feed custom requirements into an AI and have it kick out a multi-tiered secure solution with a well thought out user interface, I think that's still a fair ways away. But I don't plan to know for certain. I guess big picture, I see AI as freeing us from a lot of the drudgery of coding and allowing us to invest our efforts at a higher level. Do you have a contrarian bet against any current technology? I think but the only one I can think of is that uh, there's a lot of current excitement over the AI hardware required to generate the models that we wind up using. And of course, Apple will need a certain amount of hardware to create whatever LLM it's going to use to replace Siri with, but it needs a lot more hardware to process all of those on-device requests, i.e. the iPhones themselves. So I think that once companies have acquired enough hardware to do the AI model training, I think there'll be a shift from the importance of the training GPUs to the importance of the device inferencing done by the local CPU. So in that sense, I'm kind of betting against NVIDIA and betting on Intel instead, I think. What advice or requests do you have for cybersecurity folks? Over the years, millions of people have been hacked by being sent an XE disguised as a PDF inside of a zip file. And since I did the zip file support, I kind of feel like a bit of an unwitting accomplice. One of the common uses of such exploits is to hijack cookies, and I'm afraid somebody will hijack me in a way that allows them to steal my session cookies and then impersonate me all while bypassing 2FA, so... Please fix that. What was it like coding on an Amiga, and why an Amiga over, say, an Atari ST? I think the basic reason I went with the Amiga is just that I had been a Commodore user for years, and so just naturally gravitated to the Commodore solution. Now, I don't claim to know the ST well enough to know if Gem is better or worse than Intuition, but I guess I preferred the UI look of the Amiga, and it was probably as simple as that. Then when I came to Microsoft, by that time I was a big fan of an editor on the Amiga called Cygnused, written by Bruce Dawson and a few other folks. And at first, I was really taken aback by how crude the dev experience was in MS-DOS. I mean, I was used to having a GUI with multiple open editors, whereas in MS-DOS, the guy across the hallway from me, Chuck Strauss, was still using an honest-to-goodness line editor. A lot of people today won't even know what a line editor is, but basically, you work from a one-line prompt down at the bottom of the screen and select what line you're working on by its number. Chuck was really fast with it, but it seemed pretty ancient to me. Does working on Arduino projects make you a better engineer? I think it does. I mean, it could just be it's nostalgic and so I enjoy it, but working with 500k of RAM keeps you pretty honest. What I've learned that is that today, at least, speed is easier than memory. The ESP32 has dual CPU cores running at 240 megahertz, and that turns out to be incredibly fast for most things. But 500k is still only 500k, and if you're writing in C as opposed to an assembly, things get bigger. And as a result, I find myself doing things I used to do on the desktop in the old days, like walking through the map file to find any wasted space. And you make judgment calls like living without a particularly useful library because its memory requirements are just too high and that sort of thing. Every byte becomes sacred when you don't have enough of them. So to the extent that somebody still needs to know how to code that way, I think working on embedded systems keeps my optimization skills fresh. Because being forced to work in a constrained environment is the only way to develop and hone those skills. What personal projects outside of Microsoft have been the most satisfying? There's two things, I think. Uh, first is I wrote a book on autism, and I get a lot of daily feedback from people that have been impacted by the book, who picked it up on Amazon, and they wind up writing to me. And it's from husbands and wives and parents and from individuals themselves, and that's been really rewarding. 
The other thing is the YouTube channel, which has been rewarding and then it allows me to reach and educate a large audience all at once. It also gives me access to new and cool hardware I get to experiment with, which is always fun. Like right now, I've got three 96 core Threadrippers that I'm evaluating here in the shop, but uh, the only bad news is I don't get to keep them. The channel also gives purpose to some side projects that otherwise might seem silly, like the Pet Rock Spectrum Analyzer I did with a friend in the Netherlands named Rutger. We wound up writing a full spectrum analyzer display that runs at 30 FPS on the pet as it receives serial data from an ESP32, which means we had to write the serial I.O. routines for the CIA chip from scratch and a whole number of things like that, and it was all in 6502 assembly. Now, it was a lot of fun to work on and to get running, but without a real purpose, it would have been a bit superfluous. And the YouTube channel gives it a purpose because I used it as a tool to introduce many people to topics like 6502 assembly and FFTs, whereas otherwise I'd largely be barking in the dark alone. What's your workflow for a video? Do you script everything out? I do. I script everything in 14-point Bookman Old School in Word because I know that at that font size, it's two minutes per page. I talk too fast, so it should be three minutes per page, but now you know how I calculate the length of an episode. I record in one session on a Sony FX3 camera with a Sigma art lens at 50mm and f1.4, and it's connected to an Atomos Ninja 5 4K video recorder. Thanks to the popularity of the hard edit, if I make a mistake, I simply stop and back up to some reasonable point and start again. The teleprompter monitors the microphone and does voice to text and scrolls precisely as I read it, which is very handy. Once I've got my video recorded, I load it into Final Cut, do all the editing, add the B-roll, upload it to YouTube after rendering it, create a thumbnail, a title, and a description, and then I launch it. By the time I launch it, I've probably seen a video that I've been working on a dozen times end to end, and I have a hard time going back to look at older stuff. Also because it's just not as well done. I guess that means the process is always improving, at least. As an autistic kid, what support do you wish you had had for support back then? Well, it's important to keep in mind that this was the early 70s and autism wasn't really widely known. Rain Man was still at least a decade away and Asperger's hadn't even been named yet, so you can't really expect the people to have been very aware of it. Still, though, I was lucky in that I had a few teachers in third and fourth grade who figured out that I was a little different and who indulged me by giving me interesting extra credit projects to work on. I did a huge report on the space program with every manned and unmanned launch, which I still have in a box somewhere, along with my speech therapy workbook. Workbook ironic. The point, though, is that with these special assignments, I got to spend a lot of time passionately involved in my special interest, and I wish I would have had a lot more of that over the years. Now, my parents were great. My dad owned and operated a local hardware store where I learned everything from cutting keys to glazing windows and tinting paint. My mom was always looking for ways to get me involved in stuff like an early computer class I took on a PDP-11 at the local university. She volunteered as a classroom monitor as a way of getting me into the class, perhaps a bit too young, I think. Now, I did have a coding mentor until I was probably 16, and so that would have helped a great deal, too. In fact, when I first saw a computer, I had to experiment from first principles. I knew so little about it that I just typed English into the TRS-80 interpreter, which didn't work very well. In the end, for better or worse, it meant that I had to figure out literally everything on my own back then. What have you learned about tech trends over the years? If I count the number of technologies and languages that I was tempted to invest in learning that have come and gone and don't matter anymore, it's pretty sobering and it makes you question where you should spend your time. Now, if something's been around for a while, like Rust or of course C Sharp, then it's likely something you've got to know to stay relevant, and so I'll learn it for that reason alone. But I don't chase every new tech trend. I'd say the two biggest things are that if it's going to be relevant to a job you want, you learn it to expand your skill set. Or if it offers a better solution to a problem you're facing, it's worth knowing as a tool. Or if it's been around forever like Java, it's just something you should at least know and understand, even if you're not using it, I think, because it's just so ubiquitous within the industry. What was your workflow like for checking code into source control? Back in the 90s, everything we did was managed by a program called Slime, which stood for Source Library Manager. Now, it was really just diff, glorified, and fancied up in that it could keep track of a series of deltas against a single copy of the code up on the server. There were no branches and no forks and pretty much none of the modern functionality that you'd find in something like Git, which is, I assume, what's being used today. When we were bringing over the bajillion lines of code from the Windows 95 user interface to port it over to NT, Slime and Diff were really the only tools we had. And so, every two weeks or so, you'd copy all of the Win95 team's current code into one folder and all of the NT side of things into the other folder and then diff and hand merge all of the conflicts. I can think I paid my dues doing that kind of thing, but 
More than anything, I learned a lot because the very act of porting a ton of code requires that you're at least somewhat familiar with it, and so you learn a lot along the way if you're paying attention. One day, a new fellow named Sean Ivory joined the team, and naturally one of the first things we had him do on his first day was to enlist in the source tree. He kicked off the process, which back in the day took an hour or so to complete, and we took him out for his inaugural lunch. Now, what we hadn't counted on was that the process of enlisting was somewhat atomic, and it therefore held a global lock on the source tree while you were doing it. But Sean's was stuck at some prompt, asking for OK to overwrite a local file or something like that. And meanwhile, Dave Cutler, the architect of the whole thing, has been trying to check in some code into the tree, only to find out that some guy named Sean that he's never heard of now holds a global lock to the source tree and isn't responding. When we get back from lunch, we could hear Sean's phone ringing from the end of the hallway, and it rang and rang and rang as we made our way down to his office. When we finally got there, Sean looked down at the caller ID, which just read Dave C., and he looked at me like, oh no, what do I do? All I could say was, I guess you better answer it. He did, and we could all hear Dave C. roar on the end of the line. Release your... Do you involve your kids in your channel at all? I don't usually involve them on screen, but a few have helped with the content over the years. My oldest son did the music for the episode intro and contributes thumbnails from time to time, and my youngest daughter is handling the retail side of getting the Mesmerizer PCBs up for sale on Amazon as a vendor. It was more of an excuse to give her a complicated, nebulous problem to run off and solve, but it's been a great learning experience for her. Writing games seemed like a good way to learn. Is that why you've worked on them? To be honest, I initially worked on games not because I thought it was going to be good for me in any particular way, but just because I loved video games. I was kind of an arcade nerd, so the first thing I wrote when I got a machine language monitor for the Commodore 64 was kind of a Galaga clone, but with a lot fewer enemies. The thing is, I had just a machine language monitor, not an assembler, and 6502 code isn't relocatable. So without a symbolic assembler, the only way to insert code later is to jump out, do what you wanted to insert, and then jump back. And as you can imagine, the code quickly devolves into a mass of spaghetti. I remember working on a cycling game for the Commodore 64 back in the 80s, and I was fairly new at the whole process, even as a dev. It came time to add parallax scrolling where the tall building tops from the front would scroll in front of those in the background, and it meant tracking a lot of multiplex sprites. But my code, just kind of done on the fly, became such a mess that I had to back up, stop, refactor everything, design actual data structures and classes to go with them, and so on. It really taught me the core difference between code that is well-designed and thought out from the beginning versus kind of just packed together on the fly. If my kids want to learn the ESP32, where should they start? I think the, the best way to, is to do it is to get an M56C+, or whatever the current version of that is called, because it has everything built in. It's a small little orange thing, and it's got a small OLED display, accelerometers, a microphone, speaker, LEDs, IR, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, much more. It's super easy to get started with. At nightdriverled.com, you'll find a project called Spectrum that allows you to take three 16x16 matrix panels and make a Spectrum analyzer out of them. Other than power and ground, there's only a single wire to connect, and you can flash the whole thing from the web page itself without knowing how to code or using an IDE, so it's a good way to get started. Did you ever have the desire to pivot to something completely new? I did, actually. After about 10 years at Microsoft, I faced a problem, which was nice to have, but it was that I was making a lot more from my side hustle than I was from my day job. And for a while, I tried to do both well, but when you combine that with having a wife and kids and a lawn to mow, there just aren't enough hours in the day to do both well, no matter how genuine your intentions are. So I took a three-month leave to give it a shot and basically never came back, as by that point I had discovered internet advertising and the sharer business had really taken off by an order of magnitude or two, and it's still a very hard decision. Microsoft was my dream job, the place I wanted to be, and now I was finally there. I was finally well-established after a decade, and it was hard to walk away. Did I really want to leave this job that I'd wanted so badly to get in the first place? And the answer is no, I didn't. But at that time and place and situation, it just didn't make sense to stay. So in 2003, I left to work on my own stuff full-time. I ran that for about 10 more years and then sold that to a public company and retired for real. Sort of. At Microsoft, did you have any thoughts about stack ranking? When I was... Uh, Brand new, I just assumed the whole thing was a fault-proof meritocracy in action, but once I got into the meetings myself as a manager and saw how the sausage was made, I was a bit disillusioned about the whole process. Because once I was a dev manager and had to do that side of things for my own, I could see that much of a developer's success hinged on how passionate, charismatic, and compelling the lead was while arguing for his or her case. 
So it wasn't a pure meritocracy, surprise, surprise. It was kind of a little clicky, too, kind of like high school. I was surprised how much personality, email, and other factors played in. Now, I imagine the process is completely different today, but still flawed in some fundamental way, but I've been gone too long to know at this point. What have been your technology wow moments? Well, ChatGPT was certainly the biggest one of recent memory. Those first few moments with it as a chatbot were impressive to begin with, but once I started feeding code and screenshots of the output back into the system and having it debug my code for me, that was truly a wow moment. The other big moment for me came long ago, back when I was like 19. I'd worked on the C64 game that I mentioned earlier and then took a few years away from computers to work on cars and chase girls and do whatever else 19-year-olds do. And then when I came back, the Amiga and the ST, the new 16-bit computers were out, and they were worlds away from what I had left behind, so I was a bit overwhelmed. I didn't know C yet because I was an assembly programmer, and the Amiga code was not a good place to start. It had things like struct intuition base pointer, intuition base equals parentheses, struct intuition base pointer, close parentheses, load library, just a whole bunch of massive casts and nonsense. It's really just opening a library, but when you're coming at it brand new, it looks pretty opaque. So ever since, I've tried to stay reasonably current because being left behind like that was spooky. And I'm glad too, because if I hadn't been paying close attention to the AI space for the last couple of years, I think seeing Sora would be so far out of the realm of possibility that it would just be akin to magic. At least this way I can fool myself into thinking I have a vague understanding of how things like large multimodal models work. People are uncertain about entering comp sci today due to AI. Any thoughts? As I mentioned, I've got one in college for CS now, so if I didn't think it was still a good bet, I wouldn't have encouraged that either, but there will still be need for full-stack developers, but probably full fewer of them. I think there will be lots of new jobs, but will they just be prompt engineer jobs? I'm thinking that the better ones will be more analytical, doing systems design instead of small code tweaks. Perhaps you ask the AI to spin up a SQL instance, or write some queries, develop a UI, and so on. The bigger piece is that you can assemble into some comprehensive user solution. So in a way, it's a revival of the old systems analyst title. Because as impressive as the AI is at this point, we're still quite a ways from being able to describe a set of complex customer requirements and having it pop out a fully formed solution complete with multiple architectural tiers and a well thought out user interface and so on. We'll no doubt eventually get there, but I think it might still be a while. AI opens up a lot of opportunities to solve problems we didn't even know we had or that we could solve, and so there could be even more jobs in the long run. You raised a family at Microsoft. Any advice on work-life balance? Well, the big thing to remember is they're only little ones, and nobody winds up on their deathbed wishing they'd checked in more code. Well, almost nobody. I know a few people that might, but... My oldest wasn't even in kindergarten yet when I retired from Microsoft, but even so, with the first two, I took all the paternity and family leave and vacation that I was allowed. And then shortly thereafter, I retired to run my own business. It meant I was still super busy, but that I could, within reason, probably kind of like working remotely, set my own hours. So I could go to swim lessons and kinder music and little kickers and all that stuff, for which I am eternally grateful. The downside to all this is that my kids just have never really seen me head into a 9-to-5 job every day. In reality, though, you might not always be in balance. I mean, you might do too much work when you're young or single and that you can then coast a bit when you're older or when you have more family demands. Unless you move to Amazon, then it's pretty stressful no matter what, I hear. How do you identify which opportunities to take and which to decline? These days, my schedule is pretty full, so I don't take on many new things at all, really. But I do enjoy public speaking, particularly about autism in the workplace. But I turn down most virtual events now that COVID's over, and I tend not to do many free ones anymore. All this accepted, of course. So the whole thing is somewhat self-limiting. When it comes to YouTube, the thing I always ask myself is whether there's a fun project in it for me that I can make a video about. Other than some B-roll, I don't usually let filming intrude into the fun side of the exploration, but rather I write about it later. So it's got to be fun or rewarding of its own accord for me to undertake it. If it's just work for an episode, that's not a lot of fun. Back when I was at work, the opportunities I actively chased weren't about building an empire or anything like that. It was all about who I'd have the chance to work with and learn from and how cool the product was to me personally and how many people would wind up using it when I was done. The big difference to me is you've got to enjoy the process. It's like I'd love to know how to shred the guitar, I just don't want to spend years learning. So for me, enjoying the destination isn't enough, I need to enjoy the journey too. It's like I'd like to have done a TED Talk, I just don't want to do a TED Talk. And so I haven't done a TED Talk because wanting to have done one isn't enough to justify all the work along the way, or at least in a lot of cases. 
What were some of your biggest challenges going from dev to lead? Well, with autism, you often don't have a full understanding of the fact that people can approach the same problem or situation with completely different sets of contexts and backgrounds and expectations and preconceived notions and so on. Or at least it's easy to forget to do so because it doesn't come naturally. And similarly, I just assumed that everyone wanted to be managed and rewarded the same way that I would want to be, but it turns out they don't. Some people need more positive affirmation. Some people want power and authority. Some people want money and some people won't be happy and even if you give them all those things. But just as everybody has their own learning style, people have their own way in which they wish to be managed. Of course, I understood that intellectually, but it still took a while to internalize and modify my process. Thanks, Dave. Any final thoughts? Thanks for having me. You had some really great questions here today, and I hope I was able to give you useful answers for at least a few of them. If you at home have found any of today's episode to be interesting or entertaining, please remember that I'm mostly in this for the subs and likes, so please be sure to leave me one of each before you go today. And if you're already a subscriber, thank you. Please consider turning on all notifications for the channel so that you don't miss an episode. If once a week turns out to be too often, you can always turn it back off. If you or someone you know may be on the autism spectrum, check out the free sample of my book on Amazon. It's everything I know about living your best life on the spectrum. Thanks to Microsoft for hosting the AMA, and thanks for joining me out here in the shop today. In the meantime, and in between time, hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage.